Welcome, James. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for being here with us. Um, James is one of my fabulous new brothers in this space. Um, we actually met each other through kind of a, a coaching group about just something else that I was putting out there. Um, and we have been having the most fun Facebook conversation persons. <laughs> Every day. I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, so James, you want to tell people a little bit about yourself, what you do and your background? Um, yeah, I think, well, my background in, into getting into coaching was, uh, began at, at, as what I called the grand renovation after life imploded and I ended up in divorce a little over 10 years ago and turning inward to find out what caused all the problems. And I thought like an, any naive man that, oh, I'll, it's just a quick fixer upper. I'll just find what's broken. I'll fix it. And then I'll move on. <laughs> but Pretty quick into it, it just started to become part of my lifestyle. And uh, I met my uh, um, my new relationship, and she was in the same place doing the same thing. And eventually, I think six months in, one of us turned to the other and said, I think I, I would like to do this uh, as a career. And so we both went into the training and, and grew our relationship from that place. Um, and we started traveling a, a couple of years ago and that ended up removing all the b barriers of familiarity and routine and I became conscious at that point. And so that's really changed my journey within myself uh, and what I offer and how I offer it to clients and everybody. That's awesome. That's really cool yeah. that it was a joint journey with your spouse. That's really, yeah. that's a very cool, cool yeah. place to be. Uh, I've certainly learned, uh, it hasn't made it always an easy journey, um, but uh, I've certainly learned a lot about where I fail. And I think where I fail is where we all fail in how we navigate ourselves in relationships. Because uh, as some people find it challenging and a little bizarre when I say it, there's no such thing as relationship conflict. It's inner conflict being projected onto the relationship because we don't know how to identify it and take ownership of it. Yeah. Okay. So let's go here because today what we are going to talk about is emotions and um, connection, connection to ourselves and to each other. And I think that this is a really good um, kind of entree into that discussion. So yeah, you want to talk about that in terms of in relationships, what you're talking about there? Yeah. Like uh, the, I mean, in, in becoming conscious, I've become, I, I, I call it personal, emotional, conscious awareness, you know, becoming aware of self because we all have childhood stuff and it all, everything originates from there uh, in terms of our thought patterns, our, our behavioral patterns that determine how we interpret and navigate life and ourselves. And it creates this disconnect. I know it did for me where I lived in my mind because I didn't know how to navigate myself emotionally. I came from a family of disconnected parents and emotional neglect. And so I never learned to connect the two. So I just stayed where it was safe in my mind where I didn't have to actually uh, present myself emotionally because vulnerability wasn't something that I could consciously choose. I didn't know how to do it. That's so interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. So something really interesting here that this is bringing up for me is um, I am a very emotional person. Like my personality is one that really deeply feels emotions um, and feels the emotions of other people around me too. And um, I didn't really, when I didn't have the vocabulary to describe what was going on, I would get really, really full. Like I would just get full of all of the stuff that was going on. And then it would kind of come out in like an explosion. And, and I didn't know, like, I just didn't, I just didn't understand what was happening. I just knew that I felt like poop. Like it was not a good feeling. <laughs> and I was like, I have to get this out somehow. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think that just even having that kind of like that vocabulary around each one of the emotions really helped me a lot personally. Well, 
Definitely the vocabulary because uh, nobody really understands us emotionally. And for us, that's a real barrier where we don't feel seen and heard and understood, accepted by other people. And we judge the other people because uh, of that. But the reality of it is, is, well, who could understand you? You only are under the false belief that you understand yourself. But since we don't actually put our emotions into words and articulate them to other people, it's only through that process that we really narrow down how we feel at all. And it's partly why we just go through our day to, hey, James, how you doing? Good. How's your day going? It's not bad. What does that even mean? Is that your life? Good? Not bad? Is that fully descriptive? That's sad. Yeah, definitely. And I know for me personally that um, this was a really, so my husband and I have had a very complex marriage journey, um, as I think that they all probably are. No. Um, and, uh, and I know that there were definitely, I, there was so much of that kind of conflict that was going on between the two of us. And there was a lot of me trying to get him to move out of here and down into here. And it's still something that is hard for him to, to do. He's getting a lot better at it. And I think that for me, a lot of the work was moving from here and up into here. I think that I was like, I don't know, but I know something's wrong. I know there's a feeling here that's not, and I couldn't articulate it very well. And so the two of us were kind of like, sort of crashing into each other because we couldn't find that, that common, almost like language that would help us to, to navigate through both of those places. Mm -hmm. So you feel you nailed it? Oh yeah, we totally do it super perfectly now. <laughs> <laughs> to whatever degree that you've created a sense of ease and how you connect with what, each other, then you've uncovered uh, the truth. And to whatever degree that it still remains that you haven't, you haven't. But for me, what comes up uh, in that is, if in my experience of self and in my relationships, it isn't me struggling to learn how to navigate you. It's me learning and struggling how to navigate myself with you yeah. because I feel like we approach relationships um, wrong. It creates false expectations uh, of how we're going to relate. Uh, I think we go into relationships, Walt Disney fucked me right up, that son of a bitch. <laughs> I still believe in fairy tales. I still believe in magic. I still believe in all that stuff. And I, and I love that about me. But it created a lot of problems for me in life in that, okay, love for me. I want to have this relationship. And I, and I found this uh, woman, Carmen. Oh, she's just amazing. And she, just, she makes me laugh. And she's so interesting and all that. So when we create this relationship, she's going to be my safe haven where I won't feel pain anymore. And no. No, stop that. She's going to make you feel pain more than ever because love softens and opens the heart and what's inside comes out. The love and all the pain that you've been neglecting all these years. And when it starts to rise up, we think, oh, this relationship, I, I thought we were getting along so well. I, I thought maybe she might even be the one, but now I'm starting to second guess that because of how I feel when I'm with her. And since I only feel this way when I'm with her, I know it. I know that the problem is Carmen. Oh, this is so fascinating. This is a, I, this is a very interesting look on the inside of what's going on in men because that is so interesting because I personally don't have a problem with going to those pain places. In fact, I, I probably have like a little bit of an addiction to that where I'm like, but this is where the growth happens. You know, like this is where yeah. we find that possibility that's there. And that's so interesting that you're like, there's this, there's this weird collapsing together that can happen of like, if I feel pain around this person, they're not the right match for me. They're not the right fit. Right. And, and people judge that because they don't understand their own feelings. It's kind of like we were talking earlier. If you don't articulate and put into words your own emotional state of being, then you don't understand yourself. 
So why are you going through life expecting other people to understand you? And we go into relationships. Well, when Carmen's not around, like she went out of town last week and for a week, I, 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 we didn't see each other and I didn't feel that way. So I know that it's Carmen making me feel this way and I don't like it, so I don't like Carmen. And, or I don't like myself with Carmen. And well, I, I'm not dating David Copperfield here. We, we can't put emotions into other people, but we sure can trigger the release of what they hold within them already out. Yeah, super interesting. That's fascinating. So, um, okay, so one of my favorite things about you is that you bring in this kind of sense of fun and sort of play into, into this kind of stuff, which I so appreciate. Um, and I, and I, again, I think I've told you this before. I love the biker vibe around it. Like, it's like, let's listen to some Bon Jovi and like figure this out, you know? Um, which I appreciate a lot because I, I, I like that aspect of, um, of coaching and of this space as well. I feel like a lot of it is the, like the heart opening up and we're all crying together and like, you know, like singing songs and, and, and I love that. Like, I think that that's possible. I think there's this other possibility too. And I think it's fun to go there and explore. So I want to ask you when you started kind of like, going to this place and, and really getting to know more about your emotions and stuff. Did, did you, did you find a way of doing it in a fun way? Like, how did you go about it? Uh, I think that maintained in me, I think finding, finding humor in shit <laughs> was just part of my coping mechanism. I think it is for anybody that, that has a humorous side or any comedian their humor comes from pain. That's your coping mechanism to getting through a perspective of struggle in life. And I definitely held that. And my ego used it against me because I chose to take up residence in there. <laughs> and, um, okay, well, how do I balance out the fact that the ego is always trying to problem seek in my life and interpret everything as uh, an act against me that I have to defend myself against. That's stressful. How do I balance that out? Humor, seeing the light in it, seeing the fun in it. Yeah. Connecting to that. I love that. My balance. Yeah. Yeah. I have, there's a quote that I love that's from Anne of Green Gables. That's humor is the spiciest condiment in the feast of existence. And I just <laughs> love that so much because I think that for me, um, it makes it, it's like um, an easier door for me to walk through. When I'm going into that emotional space, if I'm like, okay, I'm just going to laugh at kind of everything that happens here. Um, I, there's still that, like, there's still sometimes the heaviness. And I mean, cause, cause that's just there. That's just mm -hmm. the, a possible thing that's there. And it sort of, um, it makes it, not quite so daunting, I guess, um, going into it. And I kind of uh, approach it that differently in that, you know, like I think most of my life, I aligned with what you just said and that, you, you know, you go into a certain situation and that discomfort is there. I'm not sure that it is for me. The, I think the discomfort is not there. It's like saying, oh, I had a really hard day today. Well, the day wasn't hard. The day was just a day. The day had no recognition that you were holding a perspective of difficulty, but the difficulty isn't in the day or outside ourselves. It's within our perspective of where are you connected to within yourself while you're looking at your day and experiencing yeah. it. Yeah. Because what you're experiencing is where you're standing inside yourself. Yeah, definitely. Finding that observer it's like um, the observer crew member is for me such a such a it's such a powerful place to be um, with coaching because it it gives me that ability to to stand outside and look in just like what you're saying and and not a lot not almost like not own it in a good way like I'm not gonna own that in a good way I'm gonna observe and be like what was that about I don't know what was that about and again then the humor comes in there for me of like <laughs> I don't know that was crazy. Let's go figure out what happened there. So. And to do that with other people is fun and it's not that difficult. 
when you learn the skill of how to do it. But how to do that within yourself is very difficult. Uh, my Facebook Live on it this, with this morning, I talked about that. Oh, nice. And um, how, you know, as neuroscience has now shown that the average person goes through their daily life 95% subconscious. And I really, I have all these goals in life that I want to achieve and I know how I want to feel while I'm doing it. And I have it all mapped out, but it doesn't seem to come together. There just seems to be something in the way. Well, the other 95% of my mind is down the other end of the football field running towards me to prevent me from making the goal. And I wonder why I feel stuck. So the whole, the whole um, pathway or the whole gateway to opening up our ability to end suffering and create emotional freedom in life is raising your level of um, uh, emotional conscious awareness. Because the thing that we have hold the, the, the most restricted perspective of in life, right here. Yeah. Oh, so good. That's awesome. Um, do you want to share your Facebook Lives in the group for this week so that they can see yeah. your stuff? I yeah. It would be really helpful, actually. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So I want to talk about um, kind of this connection. Like, how do emotions help us with that connection sort of thing? Um, well, sometimes they do help and sometimes they don't. Um, our mind really can't tell the difference between reality and unreality. Like when you're dreaming, what's happening is real. It's only when you wake up from a conscious place that you realize, oh, that was just a dream. I didn't actually do any of that, that I was actively enjoying in my dream as reality. Um, well, when we wake up, only part of us actually wakes up. The end of 95% of us never, is never awake at all. Uh, except, and we don't worry about that because, well, it's subconscious. It doesn't exist to us. So we think this 5% that we live is all there is. And, but our thoughts create our emotional reaction. And since our brain can't tell the difference between reality and unreality, it just responds to everything as though it's real. But most of what we respond to is stories our ego made up in the subconscious. So I, I find a, a lot with uh, working with clients that they'll eventually get to the point where they'll ask me, well, you know, in terms of following my intuitive place of truth within myself, which I believe in, is that voice that I hear within myself always my intuition? No. Your ego is in there as well. Your pain talking to you as well. Well, how can I tell the difference if both those voices sound the same and they're coming from within me? And I always tell people it's not in what the voice says, because sometimes, it, uh, sometimes your intuitive truth will be telling you what not to do. Well, how do I know that's not my ego? Because my ego is telling me what not to do all the damn day. And uh, well, the difference is, is that when your intuitive truth says, don't go to that door, don't choose door number two, go to door number one. When it's telling me what not to do, I just have this, this resonant energy within me. I feel connected to myself. It just has this feeling of rightness to yeah. it. And I'm in an immediate place of acceptance. Um, and it, I just feel good. I feel good. But when my ego tries to prevent me from doing what I want to do, not only, not only is it, it telling me what, like don't pick door number two, it's, it's not telling me that my choice is wrong. It's telling me that I am wrong as a person. Mm. And it's telling me, uh, it's, it's shit talking me while, I, while, while he does that and telling me not only is door number two wrong for you, but you're wrong in yourself. Mm. I don't know what got into your head that you think that you can have this thing because you know, we know, we, everybody knows you're not good enough for that. So let it go. I don't know why you do this to yourself. And now I'm feeling shit about myself. I've got this heavy dissonant energy within me and I feel bad about myself. Okay, that's not your intuitive place of truth. I love this. So this is what I think. This is why I think emotions are so important here is because if we have that awareness of, the, of what is the feeling inside of ourselves, that's what's going to help us figure out which one of those it is. Right. Um, 
Yeah. And but in figuring out, most people think, well, I need to come to a place of cognitive understanding of what's going on. So I'm going to go to my head and I'm really going to problem solve this yeah. one. Out. You don't need any of that. Shit. No. It's your ego that said all, all, all this needs to be justified with yeah. reason. No, yeah. it doesn't. No. Your body's already telling you. Yes. But you're not paying attention there. Yeah. That's not where your attention is. Yeah. Well, and it's not like, I think that a lot of times that's, that comes from, for me, it was very much of like how I was taught in, in when I was young. And not to say it's bad. I think that getting the training of logicking through stuff and, and doing all of that intellectual stuff, I think it's so important. And I think it's something that needs to happen in my opinion, in the schools. I, I like that, that I have that capability there too. I, I just, I was so, that muscle was grown so strongly in me, that intellectual quotient, that intellectual intelligence, the IQ was, it, it was, it was practiced so much when I was young and really developed really, really strongly in me that then my, my other muscles that I have, one of them being that emotional intelligence, um, it got weaker, you know, and it kind of atrophied because of lack of uh, attention almost to it. And so I think that that's, this is why, I mean, there's so many, there's so many studies out there now showing that the most successful people are the people that have the IQ, they've got the EQ, and then they've got the CQ, the cultural intelligence as well. And so, and those, this is what makes effective decision makers out there. And so having that IQ is also important. And so is that EQ. And that's something that I think, um, we actually talked about it a little bit when I was growing up in my house. Um, and it was just, I just wow. didn't practice it that much. <laughs> I know I'm so, I have a great mom. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. She, in fact, she gave me the book, um, Learned Optimism, when I was like 16 or 17, and The Road Less Traveled, when I was, I think, even younger than that, and was like, you have wow. to read these things. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, in mom fashion. Um, <laughs> and I think that that, um, like having those, those, uh, just those tool sets from a pretty young age, has given yeah. me at least some openness to this, you know, as I've been going through stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I became intellectually dominant because I wasn't connected to my emotional self with my parents. And that lack of connection to myself when I got into uh, grade school showed up by my not knowing how to uh, connect to my emotional place of fortitude. Uh, uh, I, I kind of, in my early time, uh, made the judgment that I, I couldn't, I didn't have enough oomph to get myself out of a wet paper bag. And I, I, I think that it's because of that lack of emotional connection. And when I did do really well in school was when the teacher went out of their way to connect with me. Oh. Then I felt very connected to the work and no problem. Oh. But if that wasn't there, I, I couldn't connect to it to save my life. And so, okay, well, how are you going to get through this world then when everything in this world is geared towards economic or um, educational and um, intellectual uh, endowment? Uh, compensate. Fake it. Learn to articulate yourself. Learn to be able to speak uh, uh, in a knowledgeable way um, and relate as though you are educated. Uh, and okay, well, that just forced me to become dependent and addicted to my uh, in, uh, my IQ in order to balance out my lacking of my EQ. That so now I'm just going back and reparenting myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel like a lot of coaching is that. That's how I feel about with my coaches, too. <laughs> um that's fascinating. And I, and I love the way that you said that, that it was kind of, it's almost like a compensation. And what I find so interesting now is when I go and talk with people who are, you know, like the people who are like the CEOs and the, the leaders of organizations and governments and, and um, 
you know, all of that kind of stuff, like those people who are in these positions to, um, to kind of like bring in the next group of, of people, they're standing here. And what I hear over and over and over again is I can't get good help. And there's just so much complaining about the millennials, which I have personal issues with. Um, and I think that, uh, and I think there's, yeah, there's so much possibility, um, that's there. And so, and I think that one of the things that's really important is that these, the people that I work with up here, um, a lot of times have really high IQs and have relatively low EQs. And and yet what they really want from all the people that are around them is super high EQs, almost like to help the system because the system doesn't have a high enough EQ level, basically. And so what's, I mean, it's just said over and over and over again of like the people who are going to be successful in the future are the people who have really high EQs. Even now, the people who, are, who will rise to that level of success success are the people who have really high EQs. And I'm seeing that now at the people who are kind of like at this level, that there are these people who have super high EQs and then they're dealing with the people who are like at the C-suite level who don't. And a lot of times these people are getting, they're just so frustrated and so um, kind of put out by the situation that they're starting to bounce out of the system. They're starting to be like, oh, forget that. I'm not even going to be there. And I think that this, I personally think that this proves problematic for the long-term um, kind of uh, hanging togetherness of our communities and um, of the way that we're going to go about decision-making. Because I think that we have, to, we have to stay so that in those strong institutions that we've created that help us to, create, to make decisions, we bring in that, that connection, we bring in that emotional intelligence into those systems so that then they grow stronger, they grow bigger and stronger. Um, I'm always an outside the box thinker. I, I saw a post the other day talking about dyslexia and how actually it, it creates an out of the box thinking. I have a little dyslexia. Um, when you were talking about that and how that disconnect between the millennials and, and the and the upper management levels is, is creating a problem, I wasn't so sure that I was seeing it as a solution uh, because the millennials, the 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 intellectually dominant uh, CEO level, administrative level people, need the millennials for works for the workload. Um, but the millennials don't need you I don't know. because the millennials have both ends of the scale. And while you can be sitting there as a CEO saying, yeah, but what I want my, my people below me to provide for me are the very things that I'm not providing for myself, which ties back into our relationship conversation earlier, where we're going into relationships. I want you to provide for me the very things that I don't give myself and therefore they're missing. So I need you to do that. And I'll know that you're a good fit for me and this relationship is working as long as I feel they're being met. But the moment they're not, they're not, that they're not, I know you're not doing your job. So I think that this, I love this. And I think that this is a beautiful pointing to a lot of how the millennials that I work with definitely feel like that about the situation. And one of the things that I would say, and we were actually talking about this earlier in terms of the, the work that I'm doing with vulnerable communities is that, um, there are these tools that like success, like the people who are sort of at the top levels have. There are some like brain tricks and some tools and stuff that and and neural patterns that they've laid down of just an expectation of success and an expectation of that that it's going to work out and that it's going to it's going to happen. And then sort of like they have some tools that are really actually very, very helpful. Like they are helpful. And a lot of the millennials that I work with don't have those tools that are here, that are at this, this group level, like this group level. And so that's a lot of the work that happens with the millennials is get the tools. Let me give you as many tools as you possibly can so that when you're working with these people and as you're rising up, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. 
that we keep all of those really, really great tools that are helpful, we keep them as well along with the rising kind of emotional intelligence. And then the work that is done with these people is a lot more around that emotional intelligence and, and, and making sure that we're bringing that into the system as well. Um, so that, so that these people don't lose the emotional intelligence, because that's something that I will see happen as people are trying to kind of move, move through like, and move up the ladder and sort of progress in their careers and stuff like that. I'll see them as they're, they'll, they'll start like losing their own emotional intelligence because they'll be like, but that's not what breeds success. That's not what gets me to that successful place. And I'm like, "Mm, don't, don't lose them. Some of them will lose it. Uh, That's inevitable. But um, the thing that I really, I agree with you. I see a lot of, uh, a lot of smack talking on the millennials and I don't think it's founded. Uh, The thing that I love about uh, the millennials uh, generally speaking, is that they, I consider them to be the first generation that is coming up the pipe and saying, hey, I don't really like the results that I'm getting. And I don't like the way that it's not meeting my expectations of how I want to feel about what I'm doing. So what do I need to do to look in within myself and find out what, I, what needs to change? What? I know, it's amazing. You're the first generation that's realized the change isn't an external one. So when they're coming up the pipe and, and, there's, and there's this disconnect between the old way of being and the new way of being, and they don't exactly mash up, oh, well, we need, what we need to do is find a way to meld these together. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Maybe this way is the thing that needs to go out with the bathwater. And the new way is how do we incorporate into our systems uh, uh, of supporting what needs to happen in society from a balanced perspective of IQ and EQ? Yeah, I mean, I this is a discussion that we could have for so long. Maybe it's a discussion for another day. And I agree with you. I think one of the, I think one of the really cool things that's rising now is this understanding that um, I am worthy. Like I am worth uh, spending time on myself and I, I'm not going to put up with a life where I just hate every moment of my life. Like I'm not going to put up with a professional career where I literally hate going into the office. I'm just not going to do that anymore. And then um and so for me, then the search for the tools of how do I, how do I understand what's going on here, which I think is a big part of the reason why coaching has really grown so much over the years, because I think that it's a great place to go for those kind of tools. Mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, no matter what career that, that, that we choose for ourselves, no matter what choice we make, uh, no matter uh, what goals we set, every last one of those things was concluded or decided be- based on how you want to feel. Uh, while I went into law because, you know, my father did and it's a steady career, I can really make a difference and what have you. No, you didn't. You went into law because of how it makes you feel. It makes you feel like I'm successful. I'm making a difference. So therefore I'm valuable as a person and I'm contributing in a meaningful way, which gives me a sense of being meaningful. And no matter what decisions we make, it's all based on how you want to feel. But if all your uh, perspective and all of your um, focus in life is through intellectual eyes. You've just eradicated the whole point of the whole thing. Yep. I love this so much. So, okay, we have to go, we, we have to wrap this up. Um, and, um, this has been a really, really wonderful, awesome discussion. Thank you so much. Um, so for asking. yeah. Um, so I have a feeling that some of the people that are that are tuning in and watching this want, will want to hear more from you. So where can they find you, James? Um, well, uh, people can look me up on Facebook, uh, James Robertson. Uh, I'll be doing some posts this week on the group so people will be able to see more of where I'm coming from, what I offer, and be able to connect with me that way. 
Uh, I also have a Facebook group uh, called The Practice of Happiness um, because this is my whole point to what I'm doing in life is trying to extract the things that we that are not our truth so that we can live our truth, which is, uh, I believe that the fabric of our being is made up of happiness and love. love We're just it. not connected to self. Yep. And I think the emotions are a, a good start kind of good door to start going through to figure that out the gateway yeah gateway drive right i love it yeah <laughs> i hear the bells on your end and my end so oh, it must be 12 o'clock all right well thank you so much for joining us from spain my brother thank you <laughs> thank you Carmen. namaste right. we'll see you later take care my friend okay bye-bye